Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Urban Green Live. I'm your host, John Mandyke. I'm the CEO of Urban Green, and I'm coming to you from the Urban Green Studio in Lower Manhattan. This is a program series where I'll be interviewing global experts on important sustainability issues of the day. And you get to participate too, because we're gonna have live Q&A in just a little bit. Today, we're gonna to take a look at a topic that's asked about over and over again in the buildings community. And that is how do we maximize for both health and energy efficiency, energy efficiency, especially in the age of COVID. So to explore that topic, we have our very first return guest on Urban Green Live. It's Dr. Joe Allen. Joe, say hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks, John. Joe is the assistant professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and he's the director of the Harvard uh, Healthy Buildings Program. Um, Joe has emerged as a global voice of scientific reason for the coronavirus with daily media appearances. When he's done with us, he's got about four more media interviews today. You've probably seen him numerous times. He's been on CNN, CBS News, NBC Nightly News, or in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and more. He is the go-to scientific source for everything buildings related for the coronavirus. And we're really grateful he's spending an hour with us here at Urban Green. So Joe, welcome back to Urban Green Live. Yeah, it's good to be back with you, John. Thanks. Hey, Joe, the first time you joined us in April, those who remember, you did it from your car because it was the only <laughs> quiet place. Looks like you've moved into a home studio. You're moving up. Yeah, moving up in the world. Yeah, it's the early days when uh, you know no one knew what was going on. Certainly no one was set up for everybody being home. and. Uh, like everybody else, had kids working, uh, doing school at home, and that was the only quiet place uh, I could find to do uh, media interviews, to actually do work, and I was teaching my class from the car. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to be in a, in a room now. Yeah, it looks great. So Joe, let's get right into it. I, I love your assessment on where America stands right now with the coronavirus. Are we halfway through this crisis? More, is the end in sight? Can, do we even know? Can we tell? Well, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean that's the the trillion dollar question, and and um, and you've seen ranges of estimates by different experts, and and a lot of it depends on what your your uh, definition I think is of out of it is right. So when Fauci says uh, we won't be back to normal to the end of 2021, he's talking normal, normal, no masks, no restrictions, uh, back to where we were like January 2020. Um, I'm more optimistic on the front that I think we can get back to some reopening in, in some semblance of normalcy. I wouldn't call it quite normal. Um, through what we're doing already and some advancements that are coming. So um, specifically, you know, I, I think it's really clear that non pharmaceutical interventions are working and allowing us to have a bit more freedom in what we do with care. I mean, non pharmaceutical interventions, meaning the things we've been talking about for a long time now. Uh, hand washing, universal masking. Uh, we'll talk a lot about buildings and what buildings need to be doing. So th the, these kind of universal precautions at this point. Uh, we have, uh, we can talk a lot about how the testing landscape is poised to change. And this is something that's really uh, worth diving into a bit and we can go there. Uh, we also have new therapeutics coming online and the end game is the vaccine, right? And that's when you essentially, uh, you know, we can, we'll be able to free up a lot more. But in terms of uh, normal, you know, it doesn't mean we're, we're fully closed down until then. Uh, it just means we're gonna have to be, until the end of 2021, just means we have to have a lot of precautions in place. I don't see us getting out of this anytime in the next couple months. Um, and I'd say, for the, I, I uh, like most people, are really quite uncertain about what November and December and the winter brings. Uh, there are uh, many epidemiologists who, uh, who are predicting it can be quite bad. Uh, we've seen the models out of uh, out of uh, Oregon, uh, out of uh, Washington, and um, and there are others who are a bit more optimistic because of these behavioral changes plus uh, advances in the in the testing. So uh, of course, like it's been since the beginning, just highly uncertain, which is unsatisfying. <laughs> yeah. So um, is the is the side benefit here? Do, do we finally have a systematic way to combat the normal flu? I mean, if everybody's washing their hands and wearing masks, there's been this concern about flu season and what the impact is. But, you know, is this a way to beat the, just the common flu with the common sense approach that people would take for the uh, for the coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing that, right? We, we saw this in the Southern Hemisphere where the flu season was tamped down and tamped down is too uh, light of a description 
because of these non-pharmaceutical interventions, right? We're, no matter what, however imperfect, the fact that people are wearing masks, we're doing this, right? We're not together. Uh, people are distancing. When, you, when you're at the grocery store, there's plexiglass, right? All these things are having an impact. And there are some people who are fully locked down. Of course, there are many people who have to be working right now and aren't locked down. But they're having an impact, and I'm more optimistic on that front that this flu season, that a lot of these interventions, I hope, well, two things will really uh, help here. One is that these interventions will help drive down um, flu transmission. Two is that the new rapid testing that's coming online will help us differentiate between flu and COVID. You can imagine if we don't have that coming into November and every sniffle of a kid in a school or an office worker shuts down the floor. We, we're going to need to be able to, and we are going to be able to differentiate. That's key, absolutely. Uh, the third thing I'll say it's critically important is everyone needs to get their flu shot this year, right? Normally, that's good public health advice every year, but really, you need to get your flu shot. We all need to do our part here uh, to help tamp down even further this influenza to take the pressure off our healthcare system, and two, to be able to disentangle these impacts. So uh, just a reminder, yeah, make sure it's not just the mask wearing, but get your flu shot. You've published about uh, 15 op-eds uh, on, on uh, the coronavirus topic. Um, one was six reasons for optimism. Uh, tell me, Joe, why should we be optimistic? I, you know, the, the big, so that came out in uh, July in the Washington Post at a time uh, when we, were, we saw cases rising in a lot of parts of the US. Uh, there wasn't a lot of signs of optimism. Uh, but there were some, and, and I'll tell you the big picture reason is this. Uh, it's This pandemic is the first time nearly every scientist in the world is focused on the same problem. So it is inevitable that breakthroughs will happen. And the breakthroughs that you're seeing on the front page news, um, you know, we all see these on vaccines, those data look good. But there are things happening below the fold, right, that are that the scientific community are producing these wins that are helping us get through this. And, and some of those six reasons for optimism, uh, you know, we I talked about uh, one, which is interesting, is that we're recognizing that airborne transmission is happening. So why is that a sign of optimism? Well, we've been shouting for that since February, and it finally means that maybe other people who haven't been paying as close attention will start to put in some of these controls. So that's a big one. Two, uh, I'm not going to go through all six, but I'll mention another one that's below the fold that maybe people aren't aware of. There's a series of studies now uh, showing a really consistent result that 20 to 50 percent of us have antibodies that respond to the novel coronavirus. 20 to 50 percent of people who never were exposed to the novel coronavirus. So I could say that a little bit better. It looks like our past exposure to other common cold, cold coronaviruses is giving our immune system some memory. And while it's not a perfect match for the novel coronavirus, these residual or memory T cell uh, response is able to still recognize this as foreign and confer some benefit. How much, we don't know, but it's not an insignificant amount of the population that has this. So that is another sign for optimism. Uh, the third, I don't know if you want to go deep into testing, but I think we should, uh, is the rapid, is the improvements in rapid antigen testing. So I'll let you decide if you really want to dive in there, but that's something that's definitely uh, worth, uh, gives me some optimism here. Great. Let's go back to the antibodies. So there's, you know, this has been bantered about quite a bit, and frankly, I don't know where the, where science is falling on it right now, but is there a view that if you've had the coronavirus that you have the antibodies that will prevent you from getting it again or don't we know yet? Yeah, so it's I'd say it's an open question, but uh, there are good signs. Uh, it look, earlier on, we were really quite unsure if someone could be reinfected or we, we the, the scientists were saying, talking about unsatisfying, we kept saying, well, you have some protection for some amount of time. No one knew what level of protection or for how long. Looks like now that there is some uh, protection, reinfection is really uh, rare if happening. Uh, we'll know more about that in the coming months, just how rare that is. But um, it looks like two things are happening. One is the antibody response, and two is that your, your body has a, these memory T cell response. So uh, you're more likely that even if you did get it the second time or did catch it, your body's responding if, you've already, if it's already seen the virus once. So uh, I'm, I think the news there is, uh, better than it was in the spring when we really weren't quite sure. I'd say now, by, by now, right, how many millions of people have been infected? If reinfection was happening a lot and we're eight or 
nine months into this pandemic already, we would see a lot of reinfection by this point. And because we're not, it's a good sign. It means that it's not, if it's happening, it's not common. Or if it's happening, the people have, their immune system is responding sufficiently that it's hidden and we're not really seeing it in the, in the numbers we would be. So I think that's a good sign, yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about testing. Where, where do you think testing is today and where does it need to go? Yeah, so, so uh, we're on the verge of, I think, a, a fundamental shift in how we view testing. We've been talking about this, my colleagues uh, and others, uh, through the summer, that there needs to be a paradigm shift in testing and it's happening. So let me just quickly talk about PCR testing that everybody knows about, right? And think about the time course of your infection. You get infected, the virus builds up in your body, then you're really infectious. You can infect others two days before symptoms, five to seven after symptoms, and then it tails off, right? So PCR is the gold standard. It's going to detect you down low. It's going to detect you through peak infectivity, but it's going to detect you for a long time afterwards. In fact, that's a downside to PCR. You will be way point past the point of infectivity, and it's still going to say, John, you're positive, which means you quarantine, close contacts quarantine. It's a problem. Second problem with PCR is that it's a lab-based test. It has to go to the lab, and you've seen the, the slow turnaround times, two days, four days, seven days, 10 days. It's not actionable data. So there's a new set of testing. It has a couple, you know, people are calling it a couple different names. So you'll probably hear it called lateral flow, uh, antigen tests. Some people are calling it uh, infectivity tests, quick tests, rapid tests, and it detects antigens. And so here's the difference. Think about it. You get infected, you're at peak infectivity. These new tests detect you at peak infectivity or contagiousness, and they don't detect you on the long tail. So that's good. Two, they're rapid, 15 minutes. Three, they're point of care, meaning you could do it at home. You could think of these as a home pregnancy test, but for COVID. And it's saliva-based, and they're cheap. And if we do these at scale, we can get down to the cost to one, five, or you know, even that could be as low as a dollar per test. And so it doesn't, it's not a stretch to say, well, this could really help not only uh, feel people feel more comfortable about going out and about or companies deploying these, but two, uh, it helps it helps slow the spread because now you're not waiting for PCR tests. Nobody knows if they have it. You could find out that day in 15 minutes. Or you go to the doctor's office and you're not sure if your kid has flu or something else. And this test says, you know what? It's COVID or it's not, or it's something else, or it's the sniffles. So that changes the paradigm. Uh, the good news here is that this technology has existed. It's not, you know, I'm not, um, uh, it's not snake oil here. It's, it's backed up by good science. There are many platforms already available. It's been held up by the FDA until a couple weeks ago. So just a couple weeks ago, FDA released or approved the use of Abbott's new device, the saliva-based rapid point of care test. And this scales. Abbott is saying they'll have 50 million tests this month, 100 million tests by November. Uh, and so, and other platforms are right behind it. So the door has been open now for FDA to say, yeah, you know what, these antigen tests are good, uh, at least on this one platform, it's, and others are ready to go where it's a saliva-based, at-home, rapid, low-cost test. Well, that's good news. We'll have to look for those. Let's, um, let's switch to talk about buildings. Yeah. So, you know, a big challenge, um, as we all know, is to balance energy from ventilation with the health benefits that we get from from that ventilation. Um, we've talked about this before, Joe. Is this really an either or problem? Is I mean, is can we finally find a way to have both? Yeah, we can. I, you know, it's been presented as either or for a long time. I've hated that uh, that presentation because it felt like it's uh, it's binary and it's not nothing's quite binary. And I think one of the problems is we don't think about this holistically. We tend to think about it binary and in buckets, right? So of course, uh, higher ventilation, well, maybe we should talk first about why these benefits exist. And I think there's one other component of the higher ventilation and health question right now, which is the risk calculus is different with COVID, right? Before, and I've, I've been a big proponent of this for a long time, you and I have talked about this for years, there's a lot of benefits to more fresh air, more air coming into the building, clearly. And we could talk about these uh, forever. Now with COVID, it becomes, well, it's not just that I won't have a headache, someone in my building won't have a headache, or they'll perform better on these uh, cognitive tests. No, we're talking about, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and, we're, and the economy is totally shut down, and buildings are entirely shut down. 
So in my view, we have to, it's a different conversation right now anyway, to say, well, what do we have to, we have to throw everything we can at this current problem, not ignoring climate and the other, uh, and energy conservation. But we're in a massive, unprecedented public health crisis across several domains. It's a health crisis, it's a social crisis, and it's an economic crisis. And it's existential. And I, I don't think I'm exaggerating that. You know, how many businesses are just closed? Think about New York City. How many small businesses are closed? How many of those small businesses depend on the large businesses being open and people aren't coming back? And there's anecdotes of people leaving the city. Or, you know, All right, so we have all that. So it's an economic crisis as a public health crisis. And I think buildings have a key role. How we operate buildings has a key role into keeping people safe and being able to restart this economic engine that relies on us being in buildings. So if, if for, for the building managers watching, what are the factors that you think they should be considering? I mean, can you frame it for us? You mean in terms of risk from COVID more broadly or just this energy health conversation? I, I, both together. I mean, I think I think I think it's hard to separate both. But let's yeah. start with, you know, what's your recommendation to for reoccupancy of buildings and and steps you can take there, and then let's tackle the energy yeah. question too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that this is critically important because certainly the buildings can have play a role, but it's a larger conversation of risk reduction. And the strategy we've been advocating, I wrote about this in Harvard Business Review back in April, is to use the hierarchy of controls. And I forget if we talked about this in our first, I, mean, I can't remember when our first podcast in April. Was. It was right about then. So maybe we did mention it, but there's no one strategy in and of itself that's sufficient to reduce risk. So it's a layered defense. You layer these defenses on top of each other, screening, self-attestation, stay at home when sick. And at least as we think about the hierarchy of controls comes from the field of worker health and safety. And they're just five parts, eliminate the hazard. Prioritize work from home where you can, but we can't restart the economy that way or not all aspects of it. Two, substitution is number two in the hierarchy, and that's you want to bring back core people first. I think that makes sense. Who has to be physically present in your buildings? Three, engineering controls. These are healthy building strategies. Better ventilation, better filtration. Uh, four, administrative controls. Dedensification of your space, increasing physical distancing, managing flows of people in the elevators. And five is PPE. And in this case, it's universal masking. By the way, this is the same approach you use for a, a toxic chemical at an uh, industrial uh, manufacturing site. So here, all we've done is apply it to COVID. So it has five parts. I think that's nice because it, I, I've been talking to a lot of building owners and encouraging them, especially when I talk to facilities managers, to say, we should be reminding everybody all the time that it's not just the third one, the buildings, right? That uh, ventilation in and of itself is not going to stop this. It's part of, and a key part of, a larger holistic risk reduction strategy uh, that we know actually works. And I'll just say why, how we know this works. Look what's happening in hospitals where we've driven down risk to healthcare workers, which was outrageously high early on. Hospitals, high risk environment, lots of people shedding the virus. What are they doing? Hand washing, masking, and you have to pull this one out of them. But when you remind them, they remember the third one, their buildings. Hospitals do a good job with ventilation and filtration. Infectious disease docs say, oh yeah, yeah, that one too, right? They'll say hand uh, masking and hand washing. They forget that third one sometimes. What aren't they doing? They can't physical distance. So we know we can drive down risk with these kind of basic control measures and we see it happening. And, by, and the counterfactual, the opposite of that is when we don't do those things, we see outbreaks. We see it in a bus, we see it in camps, we see it in schools, we see it in a restaurant, we see it on the cruise ship. What do they have in common? It's not necessarily the specific place that matters, but what are they doing? A lot of people, no masks, no ventilation. And so we're seeing the positive and the, and the negative of this. We put it all together, we know we can control risk indoors. Uh, whole, that's the holistic picture of risk reduction. So what, what is your recommendation on ventilation? So prior, so first, there's always a solution. I think, especially in dealing with the schools conversation right now, where people seem to be getting stuck. I can't do it, I have an old building. I have this system that can't do X. There's always something you can do. I'd say, let's start with that. Two, uh, we like to prioritize uh, in this matter. One, higher ventilation rates, going above the minimum ventilation standards, which are not set, as you well know, for infectious disease uh, control. Two, better filtration on the recirculated air. So upgrading to MERV-13 filters. Three, supplementing that, if necessary, with portable air cleaners, with HEPA filtration or supplemental ventilation. And four, 
if and only if this isn't working for you, think about more advanced uh, control strategies. Like people sometimes jump right away to uh, ultraviolet. Well, I'd say let's exhaust these tried and true, not that ultraviolet is not tried and true, but let's say more practical, lower cost, easier to implement, maintain strategies and work through that list to create these uh, uh, indoor environments with reduced risk. The number we put out there is 30 CFM per person uh, for the vent outdoor air ventilation rate. And I tell you, it's, it's, um, it's frustrating for me that, um, that we've put out a number and I haven't seen others do this. You, do, you won't see a number from CDC, uh, except for hot healthcare settings. You won't see this from WHO. You won't see it from ASHRAE. Uh, we were dealing with schools in July, trying to get them ready, New York City schools too. And people are saying, well, what's the target? We can't find one. No one was setting a target. I, and, and so you, you can't tell people, here, improve your ventilation filtration. Well, what am I, what's the target? And no one's saying, well, we don't have a target. We have to give a target. We think that's an evidence-based target uh, based on what we know now with the full caveat that we don't know the dose response for this virus. We don't know it. When we do figure this out, if it's soon or if it's many months from now, uh, that can shift our um, recommendations. It should shift our recommendations for control strategies across the board, including ventilation. So the 30 CFM, you know, building owners uh, will be concerned about the energy that's needed to do that. Um, of course, that can be offset through other mechanisms in the building by reducing energy someplace else, you know, offsetting it, demand control ventilation, there's other strategies. But let's just stay with the 30 CFM. For infectious disease, do you recommend the 30 CFM until there's a vaccine or is this like 30 CFM forever? So a couple of things I'd say right now, um, a couple, a couple points. One, the 30 CFM per person, um, a lot of buildings are probably doing that anyway, just at their current air delivery because they are um, de-densified. Sometimes by choice, saying, hey, we're, mat we're limiting uh, our occupancy to 25%, but at least uh, the groups I talk to and what I'm seeing nationally is that even when occupancy is allowed to be at 25%, you're seeing census counts below 10%. So uh, turns out right now, I think there's probably a lot of buildings that aren't paying any kind of penalty because they're not occupied or they're, they're lightly occupied. And I don't see that changing. A lot of the bigger companies are able to uh, keep a lot of their staff working from home through this. So you get the benefit there right now, right? It's not, uh, it's not like you're, you're getting killed on energy uh, right now because you're benefiting from the de-densification. <laughs> In terms of what should go forward, um, I do think it should be 30 CFM per person going forward. And here's why. Uh, and, it, and we lay this out in, in my book and um, you know, I wrote it with John McCumber at Harvard Business School. We, we talk about this. And again, we felt like people weren't talking about what the number should be. You see some rating systems say, well, 20, 30% over uh, the minimum. I'm not sure where the 30% number came from. I think it's good to go over the minimum standard, but where did that get derived from? Here's a couple of things we know. The current ASHRAE standard for ventilation, we've talked about this a million times, is the standard for acceptable indoor air quality. It is a minimum. It is a minimum. It's odor control and the basics, the basics of indoor air quality. If you look at the scientific literature and decades worth of this, it shows that these minimum standards, well, I'll say, I'll flip it the other way. When we exceed these minimum standards, when we bring in more outdoor air, clean outdoor air, there are benefits across many domains. One being infectious disease transmission. So that's obviously relevant right now. And, we'll, and is always relevant, really. And relevant from an economic standpoint for businesses. We can have the, the economic conversation in a second. Better cognitive function. We've talked about the cog effect studies and others. It's not, that's not the only study out there. There are dozens showing better cognitive performance or better test taking, better math performance. Uh, fewer headaches, fewer, less eye irritations, lower sick building symptoms, on and on. And so to me, it never quite made sense that we, we have a minimum target. Okay, ASHRAE defines it. That's fine. ASHRAE is explicit. It's a minimum target. That's not really their fault. It's just that then we've designed to this minimum target. And it's led to problems in our buildings since the 80s, late 70s, when we did this. 
And if you look at that same body of evidence, we feel comfortable that this 30 CFM per person target is, is supported by all of that science for a building that not just tries to limit you know, VOC exposure, but actually leads to um, human health and performance benefits. Yep. And there's a business proposition there too, right? So, so uh, we're gonna open it up to audience questions in just a bit. So I'll remind the audience, um, type your questions in and uh, uh, we'll get to those in just a minute. So Joe, um, what do you think are now the long-term uh, long term expectations for healthy buildings going forward generally? Uh, this, this landscape has shifted and everybody I'm sure on this call has seen it. Um, and if you haven't, then um, you know, uh, pay attention because uh, the game has changed. I, I'd say back in the early part of the year, January, February, I could name everybody who's talking about healthy buildings. Every company, every person, every scientist, right? Now everybody is, really everybody. You've seen major Fortune 100 companies stand up healthy building divisions. Multiple companies do that. You've seen commercial real, uh, landlords set up uh, healthy building operations. Uh, you've seen this in biotech, finance, the arts. Everybody's talking about it. You see all sorts of new products coming on the market around healthy buildings. Uh, we see people talking about renegotiating leases based on healthy buildings. So this market has shifted, uh, which is a good thing. And um, I think the, the shift that maybe some people aren't quite seeing, or maybe not everybody just yet, is that uh, it's not just COVID. So of course, right now, everyone's focused on COVID. You have a COVID uh, plan. Every, every company has this in place now. But the expectations are different and the good companies are already starting to say, well, what else matters for health? Water quality, right? That's not related to COVID, but people are talking about that. Lighting, biophilic design, you know, the, the usual cast of characters here. Um, so so I, the, the, there's a, been a fundamental shift in the market and it makes sense for why. I mean, look at the, look at the public sentiment right now on return to work, return to anything. A lot of people aren't going to do anything until that vaccine comes and it's widespread and, and, uh, and it's, it's widespread. So a lot of this is saying, well, how are we going to get people back in? And how do we differentiate in what is a downturn market? All things considered equal, I'm, an, I'm a business owner. I got to choose between your building and the building next to it. Same area, one building has put in these healthy building strategies. Which one am I going to take? Knowing my employees won't go back if it's not a healthy building, right? it becomes a clear uh, clear choice. So the market has shifted uh, just really abruptly. It took off. So you mentioned um, water, which I think is an interesting um, analogy because um, the water that flows to a building has to meet a standard. It's tested. Um, you know, people, you know, don't anymore fear drinking water from a tap because they know that behind the scenes, there are regulations and testing to make sure it comes comes to you in the right way, comes to you healthy. We don't have the same for air. Um, it, how do we get over that? I mean, is there a role here for, for uh, standards? We talked about that, you know, nobody, you're, you've put out the 30 CFM, nobody else has, but you know, is there a broader role for uh, air? There's outdoor air quality standards, but not indoor air quality standards. So, you know, what, what's your view on that? Yeah, we need it. We need it. They're, they're, the, they're the ones that we have for indoor are limited. They're like the OSHA occupational exposure limits. So it's like, so you don't die from, uh, you know, metal exposure in your office, which isn't going to happen anyway, right, in, in, a, in a commercial office space. So they're not really practical. OSHA admits in its own admission that says they're not, they're not updated and actually don't provide a safe environment. A couple other regulations around things like radon, and but it's really sporadic uh, and, and, uh, and sparse. And it's not really tied to, let's say, optimal health benchmarks. It's more of uh, disease avoidance strategies, right? So we could have that. Okay, look, if you're meeting the OSHA occupational exposure limits and NIOSH recommended exposure limits, great. You know, a disease avoidance strategy. What about optimal performance? Those are not set for optimal performance by any means. So there's a big need for this to define what is the targets, like we talked about for ventilation. But the same thing for, you know, there are targets for water quality. It's the basics, though, I have to say. Um, and we don't have any for, for many of these other um, parameters, right? VOC, semi-volatile compounds, these newer, um, you know, uh, the newer semi-volatile compounds that we know 
a little bit less about, but what we know about is, is concerning and we don't really have targets for this, uh, but we should. And I think there, there are people working on it, right? My team's certainly working on it. Academic labs are working on it. There are commercial offerings, nonprofits are putting some standards out and people are trying to define it. I think that's where we are in this moment. It's a key, it's a pivotal moment. Because as you, you, know, you mentioned, well, healthy buildings are, 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 this is happening and people are starting to ask for them, well, who defines that? And will we have health washing like we had green washing? Uh, and there's a problem if we cut corners on health, not that it's good to cut corners on green, but if you screwed up your energy calc for your office, okay, not good, nobody's dying. You do that in a building, you screw that up and you cut a corner around COVID or, or something that equally as serious, that's a problem. And there's a different uh, risk basis that goes into that. So a uh, short answer is, yeah, we need some standards for the indoor environment that are beyond disease avoidance standards and more towards health promotion standards. So uh, get your questions in. We'll get to them in just a minute. Joe, I want to uh, just talk a little bit about schools. I know you've done a lot on this. I know you're, you're very passionate on it. Um, you know, it's important schools for school's sake, but you mentioned reopening the economy. It's important for parents to get back to work that you know, schools are safe and stable as well. So it's, 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 uh, it's integral to everything we've been talking about. W what should schools be doing? I mean, what, what's, what are you, what's your thinking there? Yeah, so I'm glad you framed it that way. It's absolutely correct. You know, we're not really going to restart, we've talked, we're going to talk about buildings, commercial real estate. We're not going to start, restart the economy when schools are closed. And first, I think we have a responsibility, a moral responsibility as a society to open schools first and get kids back in. It is a nightmare. Uh, what's happening. Let me explain, not just my own situation where I have three kids doing school in this house on the other side of these walls. Um, let's take, let's just talk about schools and, and, where, and get away from the reductionist risk in the classroom, which I'll get to and address, but let's take a wider lens on exposure and risk, right? When kids are out of school, they're at higher risk for abuse, exploitation, violence, and neglect. The, over 30 million kids in this country rely on schools for food. Kids who are not in school are less active, less social. We have virtual dropouts on the order of tens of thousands. In Boston, 10,000 students, high school students, didn't show up in the month of May. In Philadelphia, half of the elementary school kids log in. This is a problem. We're sitting on, we're talking about cases here. We're gonna talk about the public health problem of schools closed for years. I'm not exaggerating. But now let's talk about risk in the building and how we can actually control it, because that's one, that's the other part of the conversation. Two conditions precedent. One, low community spread. So I've with other colleagues at Harvard, we've put out guidance for when these, when you meet these conditions, you can open safely. First condition precedent. And I can point you to the guidance document for anybody who's interested. Two, it can't be schools as usual. You have to put in those, that hierarchy of controls framework. Universal masking, hand washing. Ventilation and filtration are critical in schools because they're chronically underventilated. If you do those things, we know we can drive down risk. We get the benefit of the reduced risk to kids that the virus has not spared us in any ways, but that is one. Not that kids can't get sick or suffer severe consequences, but compared to adults, they're much less likely to get this, two to three times less likely. If they do get it, they're much less likely to die. Infection fatality rate on the order of three in 100,000. That's 10 to the minus five risk. It jumps to percent level as you get older, which is scary. We've all seen these differences by age. Three, it looks like they're less likely to transmit to others. So you get that some things that are happening in schools, but taking that wide lens on what this means to get kids back in schools with the risk of keeping them out. We know we can keep them safe. These controls don't have to cost a lot of money and we can't have uh, you know, the, the keeping them out is widening gaps that exist in our society already. Essential workers have to go to work. Who's watching the kids? I'm, I have high-speed internet and computers for my kids. Over 10 million kids don't have high-speed internet in this country. You've seen the pictures of kids in a Taco Bell parking lot connecting to the Wi-Fi to go to school. So we have some real, and, and I tell you, the, the other one I wrote about this in, in, uh, in June, was that the, it's a disproportionate burden on women. So you have women dropping out of the workforce, higher rates than men. So it's widening all these gaps that existed in society already. It has to be an absolute national priority to get kids back in school. I know we didn't come to talk about schools, but it is 
perfectly intertwined with what's going to happen this winter and coming out of this. It's central to what happens about us getting back to work and reopening our buildings. It's central to the conversation of disease dynamics and spread. So it's all wrapped up. And so, you know, I know we tend to think about schools or commercial real estate or air travel. It is all linked. And we have to start treating this as uh, the schools in particular, as the national emergency that it really is. Great. Thank you, Joe. Caitlin, um, I know we have questions coming in. Why don't we open it up to uh, audience questions? Sure. We have a ton of questions coming in. So thank you to everybody. We're going to try to get through as many as we can here. Um, our first question is from Yuan. Um, Hi, Joe. Thanks for this discussion. In the context of better indoor air quality and ventilations, the solutions that are proposed, while on a range of affordability, still represent significant costs that some communities cannot afford. Given that low to moderate income communities feel the negative effects of both energy transition and COVID-19 disproportionately, what are some insights you can share for these communities to balance health and energy moving forwards? I love that. Thanks. I love that that's the first question because this is my biggest concern with the healthy buildings movement. If it's a movement for, you know, the shiny new building in Midtown New York or London or, uh, and, uh, and not a movement for everybody, uh, then it's a failed movement. And so we absolutely have to put in these programs and policies in place to drive these solutions all the way upstream and not just to the commercial real estate market, all the way through residential and including affordable housing. You talk to all the, I, I talk to physicians at Boston Children's Hospital who talk about this. They're treating the same kids over and over and over again every time they come back to the door with no effort to move that upstream. So the idea again that this is a cost is true only if you, it's a narrow lens on the costs and what it takes to implement these healthier building strategies. Take affordable housing. If we take a holistic perspective, we're saving money, a lot of it, if we drive investment into better housing uh, around these healthy building strategies. You're preventing all those downstream health effects or limiting them or mitigating them. So it's absolutely critical that we think about not just um, you know, healthy buildings in this context of, let's say, downtown New York City and the high rise in Midtown, but a wider lens around equity, too. And I agree. The other part about healthy building strategies, I, 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 they're not expensive. They're expensive, like I said, when we narrow it down a bit and, and just think about the, the cost. Some of them have a higher cost. Some of them don't. Um, but it's... When you, if you factor in the health benefits, population-wide, individual benefits, or even benefits to the bottom line of the company or organization, or the value of the property, residential or otherwise, um, the benefits far outweigh the cost. I think anytime we have the cost conversation, again, another wider lens is really uh, necessary. It's a really good comment. Great. Um, I have a couple questions here about uh, the 30 CFM per person. Uh, Dan asks, hospitals have high energy intensity due to increased filtration, high air changes, tight temperature and humidity requirements, using in-room air cleaners and pressurization of spaces. If these strategies are applied to schools and offices, how is there not a trade-off between energy and risk mitigation? Schools currently require 10 CFM per person for ventilation, 30 CFM is three times that. Yeah, so good comment there. Um, so a key distinction, right? I'm not saying uh, every building should be run like a hospital by any means, right? It's big, the context matters. And there you have much higher risk, uh, obviously, for infectious disease transmission. So it's not the case that we have to operate like uh, we do for hospitals. Um, the strategies we're talking about for schools in particular are uh, – Really, a, there's a cost to them for sure, higher ventilation rates, but it could be higher ventilation rates just from opening up windows. Or in the case of the importance of getting kids back to school, it's putting a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter into every classroom, which is an expense, a couple hundred dollars. Could take that against the cost of keeping kids out of school, and it's a trivial investment, actually considering the trillions we've pumped into the economy to, to pump up the economy necessarily, uh, why haven't we done that same to get kids in school? So the cost, at least in the COVID context, yeah, we're not saying every building has to be run, um, you know, with uh, like hospital airborne isolation infection rooms have HEPA filters on every, uh, on the exhaust, or they're hitting 10 or actually 12 air changes per hour now. 
So that's not what we're we're uh, we're saying for this. There is an energy penalty. There's no way around it, and it's worth the conversation. That again, it's it's I'm repeating myself, but it's 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 the way I think about things is to take a step back and think about holistic problems and holistic solutions. So obviously we have to clean up and decarbonize the grid, right? Let's start there. Now, I know there are different challenges. Certainly there are different challenges for New York City versus elsewhere, but that's absolutely key. Then can we tackle low hanging fruit in terms of energy efficiency in our buildings? Can we make better decisions on the technologies we're putting in in the first place? In other words, running higher ventilation rates while also energy saving through other technologies or approaches to how we ventilate those spaces and designing better in the first place. So it's not this, you know, again, binary, yes, it's energy or health. That's what it always comes down to. It's actually not. We can, we can take a step back, think holistically, knowing that, of course, of course, we have to keep our eye on the other slow roll, and no longer slow roll, crisis in climate and building central role in contributing to that through energy consumption and on-site fossil fuel combustion. All right, uh, this other question is from Barry. Have you looked at air changes per hour versus CFM per person based on density as well as occupancy? Sure, yeah, and actually for schools, we opted, to, of course, they're related, and, and even the CFM per person is a simplification because as ASHRAE uh, has it correctly, it's an area and a per, person, per, per, per area and per person calculation, simplified as a per person based on typical occupant densities. Um, and then air change, of course, ties right into that based on the occupant density and the volume of the space and, and, and what you're going for there. And for schools, we actually, we spent a lot of time on this in the, on a weekend in July with some other faculty around the country and opted to, at least in our guidance documents, uh, have schools target air change per hour instead of per person, a CFM per person number. It's a simplification. Um, we like it. It's easier. I think it's more intuitive. We're, again, we were trying to give guidance that is not, you know, we're designing schools for the next 30 years. It's how do we get kids back in school in the next 30 days? And um, so there we say four air changes per hour is good. Five is excellent. Six is ideal. If you're hitting the ASHRAE minimum targets at typical occupant densities for schools, you're roughly around three air changes per hour. So it's some, the color said uh, first person, 10 CFM per person, pretty sure it's 15 CFM per person. 7.5 liters per second per person is the ASHRAE standard for classrooms. So you know, that'll get you about three air changes per hour. We like upping that to four or five. You think about the turn from a turnover sense, again, it's intuitive. You, you're getting every 10 or what, 12, 15 minutes, you're turning out the full volume of air in the room. And we like it because it's also uh, a nice, easy calculation to say, well, if I have X amount of air coming in from outdoors, and we're circulating some percentage through a high efficiency filter, or I'm using a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter, it's easy to add up those air changes to hit the target. And we found that schools like having an air change per hour target that's something they can shoot for. It's really intuitive again to say, okay, I'm trying to get the five air changes. Which combination of approaches will get me there? Um, this question is from Sheena. Uh, what about air ionization as a technology to help reduce COVID transition for new construction projects? Yeah, I, you know, a lot of uh, people are talking about this and, and all sorts of new technologies. First, I go back to what I said in this prioritization. I would go with uh, higher ventilation rates, higher filtration recirculated air, supplemental control strategies, and then these more, I'll call them advanced, may not be the right adjective, but um, additional, let's call them, control strategy to consider. Well, some people are thinking about ionization, some people are going to uh, UVGI, ultraviolet germicidal radiation, others are trying some other techniques. Um, but I think there's a place for some of these technologies uh, in, in the right context. If you're in a uh, hospital waiting room and your, your system can't bring in more outdoor air, you can't, you can't handle the pressure drop with a better filter, um, uh, or other reasons, there's a lot of people who are potentially infectious and you wanna do something. So I think there's a role, it's context dependent. With these newer technologies, not that that's new, but let's say newer applied technologies, uh, we have to think about the evidence base that they work and not just evidence based in a laboratory, right? A lot of these things work in a lab, but how do they work in application? Is there data that you can be shown from a manufacturer that says this reduces risk? 
This is effective against SARS-CoV-2. Of course, it's going to matter the application, the, the flow of air, how many, in this case, how many ions. And with some of these, we have to be really careful that we don't generate unintended uh, hazards. In the case of ionization, you can generate ozone. Ozone is a respiratory irritant. You can generate ultrafine particles, another respiratory irritant. You can generate formaldehyde, another respiratory irritant. So for me, it's always, well, can we do these other control measures where the evidence base is deep, both laboratory-based and field-based? They're cheaper, easier to maintain and operate, and there are no known, uh, there's not a potential for a secondary effect. So for me, it would require a much deeper evidence base before I gave a recommendation to put in, remember that fourth control strategy, one of these newer technologies before I exhausted the other approaches. Hey, Joe, let me jump in and, and, and carry on a little bit about filtration. Is there, um, for buildings that can't bring in additional outdoor air, uh, because their systems are maxed, or if the energy penalty is too high and it's it's uh, the energy analysis show it's easier to filter versus you know is there is there a trade off here I mean can you can you do filtration and not ventilation uh, the increased ventilation or do you need to do them both together? Yeah, so no, they're all you're doing the same thing, right? I think the way to think about it is uh, like total clean air. In this case, clean meaning you know uh, in the viral sense. Right? So outdoor air can be dirty. Look what's happening on the West Coast, right? So there, bringing more outdoor air is a problem right now, unless you're filtering that air to a high degree before it comes in. And in that case, you would want to decrease uh, the amount of outdoor air coming in, increase filtration. So they're working you know, together, and it's going to matter about the volumetric flow of clean air being, you know, two, a couple mechanisms for viral removal. One is, uh, it's de deposition. Over time, some particles will settle out. Two, dilution. Three, you clean the air through filtration. Or four, it's absorbed in the lungs, deposited in the lungs. Of course, we're trying to stop that from happening. But if you model this, if you do, if you do an indoor air quality model, you have to account for all four factors, including lung deposition, which tells you something. And so these two are working similarly. So you can get there with a high degree of filtration. In fact, that's the idea of a portable air cleaner in every classroom, or I know some organizations are wheeling in industrial grade, uh, portable HEPA systems, give you 500, 600 CFM of air through a HEPA filter. So that's clean air, would count towards your air changes. So there are other strategies for sure. In fact, this is what people should be doing on the West Coast right now. Great. Um, I have a question here. What kind of international information sharing is going on that could help move solutions forward for vaccines and other treatments? Yeah, I, so uh, the question's a good one, even before the vaccine and treatment thing came in, because I tell you, um, I don't know if the public always sees this, but the scientific, scientific machine internationally is roaring. Uh, I have myself have established, I can't even count, probably over 50 new scientific collaborations around the country and around the world, people I've never worked with, because everyone is open right now to finding solutions, right? Normally, like any other industry, we not compete, but we, we, everyone wants to have the first new paper out. This is, everyone's like, I hear you're good at this. I'm good at this. Let's get together and solve this problem fast. And this is happening across genetics, epigenetics, vaccines, therapeutics, indoor air quality, building sciences, you name it, medical communities doing the same. So uh, you should be heartened, I'd say, you know, and, and from a US context, our investment in the basic sciences is paying dividends. Uh, and, and this is happening. It's actually, it's a, it's, as we come out of this, I hope we double down on, on our investment because some things that we invest in that we, I think we tend to think of as a public say, well, what's the utility of that science? Well, all of a sudden, these new techniques and biostatistics are really relevant that we didn't think were going to be relevant to understanding vaccine trials. Or this new study that came out yesterday from my, my colleague who studies cell death, who then says, you know, I'm going to apply that to these receptors in kids to understand why kids are less likely to get it. They've never studied this topic. And someone might say, well, why do we really need to study his area? So anyway, long story uh, said shortly is that, yeah, there's, there's unbelievable cooperation happening. And I think this is why you see so many of these scientific uh, breakthroughs that are happening. And it's and we should be reminded, it feels slow. 
it's breakneck speed. We've never produced a vaccine in a year, let alone, it's been, it take, the quickest has been four years, I believe, it's, the, it's at least three, I think it's four years. Uh, new therapeutics coming out, these advances in testing that I talked about, uh, all of this is happening really at extraordinary, an extraordinary pace, and it's because of that collaboration. Great, I have a couple questions here about some specific building types. Um, so restaurants, uh, Catherine asks, indoor dining in New York City is opening soon. How important is the ventilation system in the restaurant? If there's truly only 25% occupancy, would that uh, de facto mean that there is enough fresh air, as you said about offices? Yeah, it's, um, it becomes even more important in a restaurant for the, re for the obvious reason that um, you have people without their masks on. And so if you look at the outbreaks that have happened, including the high profile uh, outbreak uh, in Guangzhou, which is just about, not about rest, it's a, it's a restaurant, but it really tells you the conditions that we talked about. No masks, recirculated air only, blowing across people, the infector onto other people, and you had an outbreak. And so those conditions, even under de-densification, uh, exist. So this is where, if you think about the hierarchy of controls, the fifth one was PPE and mask wearing. Now you've taken that out in restaurants. Yeah, the workers have it, but a lot of people don't, and they're talking and eating. And when you talk, you're generating more aerosols. That means your other controls have to be even stronger. So you, you lose elimination because people are out and about. You can't substitute away the hazard. Administrative controls, yep, you can keep tables further apart. You can be densified, but this is where now ventilation filtration become absolutely, absolutely key. Uh, along with the de-densification, because a uh, mask, if you look at all the risk models, the ones my teams have built, other professors have built, uh, the engineering controls reduce risk. Ventilation, filtration, uh, the, the de-densification reduces risk. But the single biggest driver of risk reduction indoors is mask wearing. All right, I have a question here about schools. Uh, in school buildings with good HVAC systems, would it make sense to just open the windows? Is that enough? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it depends on your system. So it starts to get, the generalized guidance starts to get real specific real fast. But in general, right, if you have a good ventilation system, you're bringing up outdoor air, then no, you don't want to mess up the balancing there. But as a strategy, like for many of these schools uh, in New York and elsewhere, um, opening windows is a good interim strategy. Now, I wrote a piece about this in the Washington Post maybe three weeks ago, as recognizing we are we are running out of time, limited time, limited resources. What can we do to get these kids back? And we had done some testing at some schools, uh, even showing that opening the windows six inches can give you air exchange rates that are three, four, five, six, over 10 sometimes. Of course, depends on the pressure differential, the, what's happening with the weather outside, the wind. So all of this matters, but the idea is that, yeah, even a simple tactic, people say, well, like, you know, does that really help? It can really help. Open up the window. You know, people know this in their house, right? You open up window, maybe you don't get the air movement in, you open up the door, you can start to feel a breeze. Get the cross ventilation going. It, it's, it's a time for the real basics. So the window opening can help. Importantly, though, it shouldn't be used as we're done at that point. I think it's a, a strategy to buy time to put in the more um, permanent fixes, uh, especially as we start heading into the winter. But I also don't buy the argument that, hey, we're going to have to close our windows in New York and, and Massachusetts or where I am in November or December. Yeah, it might be true. I also think we're going to have to get creative and clever here. If that means kids wearing their coats or big sweaters, that's what it's going to have to take. Uh, we're, in, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so I know people want to get back to normal. Uh, but that kids being back in school is normal. And if that means they have to wear a winter hat indoors, I'm all for that. Uh, so. Okay, uh, this question is from Rebecca. Can you recommend a publication or outline of healthy building strategies and associated costs? Sure, but it's self-serving. <laughs> so um, we have a uh, two Harvard Business Review articles. One I wrote a couple of years ago called Stale Office Air is Making You Less Productive. Uh, two, I wrote a Harvard Business Review article with uh, my colleague, John McCumber at the Harvard Business School. Um, I forget what the title is. It, it, is the, uh, the healthiest building in the world worth the rent or something to that effect? You can look up Harvard Business for you, my name, you'll find it. Um, three, my 
John and I also wrote a Harvard Business School case study about 425 Park Avenue, right in Midtown Manhattan, l l holding building, Norman Foster designed, uh, where we walk through the economic argument for a healthy building. So it's, sent, it's right in your, you know, it's Midtown Manhattan. Uh, so that's another one. And fourth, this is the plug. Yeah, I, I have a book. Our, our, the whole theme of the book, it came out in April, is building performance drives human performance drives business performance. And I think we make a compelling argument that these building decisions are good for health, and then we walk through how and why and the economics of why they're good for your business too. So a couple of resources, two HBR. I think we have an HBR podcast called Is the Healthiest Building in the World Worth the Rent? 425 Park Ave, A Tower for the People is the name of the case study at Harvard Business School. That's public. And then our book came out in April. Great. All right, I have one last question here. And thanks again to everybody who submitted. We had a ton come in today. Um, this question is from Sarah. Joe, can you please speak more to the interrelationship between energy and balancing health? Uh, ventilation power, ventilation, fan power, UVGI lights, other such tactics. What are the impacts to overall energy use, carbon, and climate change? Yeah, it's a good question. That's a lot for the last question. I think what we're talking about here is is the holistic healthy building strategy. And we try to lay this out in a couple of chapters in the book and elsewhere that there's health within the four walls. And then our choices about our building is influencing health beyond the four walls. And we have to tackle all of it. There's no shortcuts here. Um, but you know, you mentioned there's some specifics mentioned there. Yeah, things like UVGI will give you um, you know, air cleaning without the pen, uh, penalty, uh, energy penalty for the pressure drop across a filter. So we have to constantly take into account all of these factors, including can we, are you doing continuous commissioning to drive, we can save energy through that, better technologies, energy, energy recovery ventilation. Are we being smart about when and where we're dumping air into our buildings? So uh, improving ventilation effectiveness and think about how we design buildings in the future. Can we increase ventilation effectiveness? Uh, demand control ventilation, of course, the use of real time environmental sensors, again, to help us refine and target, make sure we're delivering a healthy building at the lowest energy uh, expense that's possible. So it's all wrapped up. And when I talk about not being binary, it's true. You know, I'm not saying, hey, throw in ventilation. I don't care about climate change. Uh, clearly, that's central to what our team has been doing for years. And we actually have some tools we didn't really talk about. John is really familiar with this. We presented this uh, in India first a couple of years ago that we call COBE, the co-benefits of the built environment that allows you to quantify your energy savings in terms of health. So it's a nice extension to say, well, we can add a value proposition here to this whole conversation, turning energy savings back into a quantified health metric, not a hand wavy, well, I'll reduce carbon. What, you know, what, what are we quite sure the impacts are there? We know it's helpful. We can actually quantify that down to the missed school days. So um, anyway, that's a, a lot, there's a lot to unpack there and that right at the end, but it, it, I'd say the big picture is, yeah, healthy buildings is not just about the people indoors, it's also about the relationship to our natural environment, which is ultimately a health conversation too. Well, Joe, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, we really, really want to thank you for uh, spending time with us today. I know this has been really informative. We had a great turnout, ton of questions. Um, so we appreciate you carving out uh, your precious time uh, to spend time with us at Urban Green. So thank you. Today's program is a, a great example of what we do at Urban Green. We take on the biggest challenges with the biggest solutions that have the biggest impact. If you don't know us, check us out. Uh, we do that through our four key activities. We convene, we research, we advocate, and we educate. Um, and today was a good example of uh, how we can bring that together. And Joe, we're, we're really pleased that you were able to join us. So thank you.